but we're going to start the show uh, with connecting with uh, Jeffrey Miller. Now, we talked about Jeffrey last night with Robert Patman. Uh, Jeffrey is a political analyst, and he joins us right now. Good evening, Jeffrey. Good evening, Pat. Chewie's playing hard to get. He'll be here at some stage, and his little wookie face will just pop up to join in on the conversation. That's how we roll. Um, yeah. Je Jeffrey, really very keen to get your uh, your opinion, your expertise around the New Zealand Defence Force uh, now having a presence, or shortly to have a presence around the Red Sea for the situation with the Houthi, 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 uh, attacking ships uh, over in that area and what that says to the world. Something we picked up on that you said on One News last night was talking about New Zealand's independence and how this may impact that. Would love for you to expand on that and share your thoughts about it. To you, sir. Yeah, I, I think this announcement this week is, is very interesting. Uh, there was a lot to unpack with it, and I spent you know, several hours on, on Tuesday going through the weeds on it all. Um, the, the government announced this, and they were quite clever about the way they did it. They uh, put in a lot of context about other missions that New Zealand has been involved in in the Middle East, such as the MFO mission that we've been in and the Sino multi-force yep. uh, and observers, multinational force and observers, MFO, which we've been involved in since 1982, which is a peacekeeping mission in the Sinai and Egypt, um, after Egypt got the Sinai Peninsula back um, from Israel, uh, and they also mentioned the UN Truce Supervision Organization, which is in the border regions of, of uh, Lebanon, and, and uh, that's been ongoing since 1954, and New Zealand has been involved in that. So they, they sort of suggested that this was just another one of these kind of operations, and yet it is actually very different. We're going to be one of just a handful of countries that are bombing Yemen collectively. That's what we're going to be working on. Wow. This is in the UK, US airstrikes on Yemen that are ongoing at the moment. There's only a, a very small group of countries that are involved here. The other four that have been mentioned as directly involved in providing military support are uh, Bahrain, Canada, the Netherlands, and Australia. That's it. And the United States and the United Kingdom. There are a few other countries that are, have been on the list, uh, but they're, they're not providing direct support um, in terms can of. I, can I just can I ask you something? I, I, I just want to get real clarity on something. Our involvement in this is going to be seen by the world or is literally our involvement in the bombing in Yemen? It is. It is. And look, we're, we're going to have a very small level of involvement, involvement. You know, there are only six New Zealand Defence Force personnel that are being sent. We don't yeah. have a combat wing to our Air Force. And this yeah. is a... <laughs> Yeah, this is an, an air force operation. It's an air strike operation. So naturally, our capabilities are limited. But I, I think it's the, the symbolism here that that counts. And a lot of these things, uh, things happen gradually over time. So in terms of New Zealand's independent foreign policy, I, I said it could be the beginning, could be at the beginning yeah. of the end of New Zealand's independent foreign policy. And I think a lot of things add up over time. You know, if you go back two years ago, New Zealand introduced autonomous sanctions against Russia. Before that, we didn't have a mechanism to uh, introduce autonomous sanctions against the country. We only uh, enforced UN sanctions. But then Russia invaded Ukraine, and there was a lot of pressure on the government, so they introduced an Autonomous Sanctions Act, or Russia's Russian Sanctions Act. So we have the ability to put sanctions on Russia now, and we have. Uh, that's an example uh, yeah. of where we've changed our foreign policy. You know, Jacinda Ardern... And Chris Hipkins both attended NATO summits, and we're strengthening our partnership with NATO. Um, that was something that Labour did. So I, I think it's not even necessarily well, something that well, just national, but, but it's happened just over to, successful government. Just to check in again, will this damage our reputation with NATO? Say, because you you just said that they attended NATO. This decision to get involved that will lead to Yemen getting bombed and us being kind of associated with that. Will that damage our reputation in NATO? No, it probably would enhance it from NATO's oh. perspective. I mean, well, you've got the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, which are probably the two most powerful members militarily in NATO. Right. So, you, you know, I think that NATO would be very happy with 
New Zealand uh, joining this operation. No, it's not a NATO operation, but it's a US and UK led operation and New Zealand's providing support for it. So yeah, I think NATO would be quite happy with what New Zealand's what New Zealand's committed to now. Um, the independence that you're talking about, the starting oh look, we got a we got a reef friend in the green room. Let's bring him in. Hello, Chewy. Hello. You're with us, yeah? Sorry, with just us, yeah. wrestling with a computer update no. at the exact wrong time. All good, all good. Um, okay, Jeffrey, sorry. Uh, the question is that um, independence that you've talked about. The big and this, you know, hypothetically could be the beginning of the loss of independence. How does that independence serve us at the moment? Like, if we lost it, if this tarnished it, how would that impact us? Independent foreign policy. I mean, it, it's it's more than just a slogan. Uh, I think sometimes you get other commentators who who see this as a slogan and they they say, "Oh, look, every country's got an independent foreign policy." And no, look, this is a, a way of explaining. The position that New Zealand has taken since the 1980s when New Zealand stopped being a US ally and the way that we interact with the world. We really, we talk to everyone, we try and keep on good terms with everyone and have good relations uh, with, with as many countries as we can. And we try to avoid being part of blocks and alliances. Perhaps that's the way to see it. It's a block-free foreign policy. Doesn't necessarily mean we're non-aligned, um, doesn't mean we're pacifists necessarily. But it means we make our own decisions in our own interests. And this kind of decision, you know, to, to go in and support a military operation that doesn't have a UN mandate, that is not part of a very broad based coalition. I mean, the anti ISIS coalition is an example that I used in my column this week, 2015. That was at the invitation of the Iraqi government. And the coalition to defeat ISIS has you know, over 80 members. And even at the beginning, it didn't have 80 members initially, but we were among dozens of countries that went in uh, and joined that operation. Uh, you look at our um, you know, operations that we've done under UN mandates in the past, um, you know, this doesn't have a UN mandate. Uh, it's not like those operations I mentioned earlier, the one in the Sinai that we've been in since 1982, the one in Lebanon that we've been in since 1954. Um, it's not even like the uh, combined maritime forces. So this is a what we've been involved in in Bahrain. It's a naval operation since 2013. Uh, it's not even really like that. There's another um, operation called Operation Prosperity Guardian that the US started uh, last month. And that's really a naval operation and a much bigger group of countries, over 20 countries are being involved in that. And that's a maritime patrol operation. I would, I find, I would find that less problematic than what we're doing now. Because right. they're not directly bombing uh, Yemen. The prosperity, Operation Prosperity Guardian, it's more of a maritime patrol surveillance operation. It's an extension of the combined maritime forces and their activities. That's a long running operation. It's been focused more on criminal activity, drug smuggling, uh, narcotics, piracy. Um, and it's, you know, it's an extension of that. Uh, we weren't named as one of the members in Operation Prosperity Guardian, which I thought was perhaps surprising because we already are involved in the, the wider combined maritime forces operations that are based out of Bahrain. Um, but you know, you've got countries like Singapore that are involved in Operation Prosperity Guardian that have agreed to that, that have said, no, we don't want to be part of this airstrike operation. Mm -hmm. It's an elite group of countries, a very small group of countries that are being involved, that are involved in this, these airstrikes on Yemen. It's the very sharp end, the very hawkish end of the US response towards uh, the Houthis at the moment. And we're part of that very elite club. It's a very unusual place uh, for New Zealand to be in. Yeah. Joey, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, if, if we look at our response to uh, the conflict in Ukraine, where we com committed defence staff to uh, intelligence and surveillance, that, that sort of made sense to me. As you mentioned, the, um, the New Zealand Navy has been involved in um, freedom of, of of shipping operations and and you know off the coast of Somalia and in the Red Sea. Previous, I, I don't have a problem with any of that, but it it, it just seems that Luxon has leapt at the opportunity to be seen as as like a decisive leader and wants to run along after the big kids, without mm. any 
consideration of, of the bigger aspects of foreign policy? I mean, I'd, I'd see it as an evolution. As I say, I think governments from the left and the right have been involved in this. I think New Zealand's foreign policy is being reshaped as we speak, and we are being realigned. Where our foreign policy is is becoming more aligned with that of Australia and the United States. And a lot of the dis discussion is about AUKUS, right? And whether New Zealand will join Pillar Two of AUKUS, this pact between Australia, UK, and the United States. Uh, but you know, there's a global level to this as well, and uh, we can become more aligned with the United States and other parts of the world, not just our own, and including in the Middle East. That seems to be what's what's happening. There's a lot of pressure on New Zealand at the moment. You know, pressure comes in different forms, but the parade of top US officials coming to New Zealand in the last a year or two is, is not an accident. Uh, you, they want New Zealand on their side. Australian officials want New Zealand on, on their side as well. New Zealand is very heavily influenced by Australia and by what Canberra says. And look, we get it. Look, culturally, we're very similar. But that doesn't mean in terms of foreign policy, we have the same interests. Australia is five times bigger than New Zealand in terms of population and has very different interests. It's a middle middle power, if you like. New Zealand's a small state. It's more like Singapore or Ireland or Switzerland in terms of population. Uh, I'm, in my view, we should be working more with other small states. Uh, I've just spent several months in the Gulf for my research here. There are a number of small states there, the UAE, Qatar, Oman, for example. Um, then you've got, as I said, the likes of Ireland, Singapore. What about working together more with these small states and try and mm. focus on diplomacy, de-escalation, dialogue in these crises. It's true, you know, New Zealand is a small trading nation. We do rely on global trade and war is terrible for business. Aside from, you know, the moral uh, problems with war and the humanitarian disaster that we're seeing in Gaza at the moment, war is terrible for New Zealand's trade. So I agree we should be doing something to stop uh, the growing escalation and the, the fighting that we're seeing in the Middle East. But I think the way to do it is to focus on our strengths. And I think New Zealand's credibility is very high. We've got a good reputation. We're seen as fair-minded, as honest. We're not part of the block. So, um, you know, that certainly came through in all the conversations I had with officials over in the Gulf that, um, you know, they appreciate that from New Zealand. Now. We, they appreciate our independence. Uh, and I think we could do a lot of good and we could do more good for the world uh, by using that independence than by just being another name on the list as far mm. as a, another ally of, of the US. I mean, there are plenty of them um, and I have their place. Look, what's good for Australia might be good for Australia. It doesn't mean it's the right recipe for us. I think different states can do different things. Australia, what Australia does is fine. That might be good for them. And they're a long-standing US ally. They're a much bigger country. They're, you know, got a much back, bigger coastline. You know, they've got different uh, perspectives perhaps on the world than New Zealand does. Uh, but we shouldn't just be playing follow the leader here. And we should be we should be really thinking carefully and acting in our own interests. Um, I'm interested as well. If I think about you know getting alongside another country, making an agreement with a country, signing a contract. I know it's not a literal thing with a country. There's wins and losses for both sides. What is the what is the win for New Zealand to get involved with Australia and America in this situation? And why does America want New Zealand in? You kind of made it clear there that America and Australia really want us in. Why? What's the win for them? That's a really good question, Pat. I, I guess it's because of New Zealand's good reputation and because of our independence, we're particularly valuable. We, we bring credibility right. to an operation yeah. like this. I think that's the biggest thing New Zealand has to offer. I mean, look, six intelligence personnel are not really going to move the dial. Uh, yeah. It's the fact that New Zealand is involved. If New Zealand is involved, then it must be a big problem, right? From the US perspective, from the international perspective. And if even New Zealand is willing to go in then this operation must have merit, then the airstrikes you know, must be warranted. So we, we're helping to improve the reputation perhaps of this mission, um, these airstrikes on, on Yemen, on Houthi targets, and we're, try, we're helping to improve the credibility overall of it and the legitimacy, I should say, of what's happening. Mm. And, and that's probably what we're providing. So we're using our good name um, to support this this operation. I think that's probably what we provide to it. 
it's funny that we're the little guys. We're the like the non-combatants. We're the smallest of everything. Yet our name seems to what you're what you're saying is our name seems to be the value, as opposed to anything else. So that's what America gets out of it. What what does New Zealand get out of this? Yes, yeah, what I, I struggle with, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I I just take a different viewpoint to perhaps some of my uh, colleagues on on all of this. I, I don't think New Zealand's interests are, are best served by being part of an alliance. I mean. We, we paid a heavy price with our nuclear-free policy and breaking free. Uh, it was a difficult time for New Zealand foreign policy-wise in the 1980s suddenly being cast adrift, but we did very, very well out of that. And that gave us credibility and helped us when we were building relations with countries like China and lots of countries all around the world. It's not just China, but countries in Asia, countries in Latin America, uh, countries in Africa. They all appreciated the fact New Zealand was independent um, was not a US ally anymore, and they'd made that decision to act in its own interests. And we did very well for ourselves in the post-Cold War period. And I think we can still use that independence to good, we could put it to good use in terms of that dialogue, diplomacy, de-escalation role. It's a very valuable role. There are very few countries that really can actually do this. It really can only be the small countries that can be the go-betweens, that can be the intermediaries. You've seen what Qatar is doing at the moment with the situation in Gaza. They're acting as a go-between, mediating. It's a very valuable role. I don't mean that New Zealand can necessarily do the same or that we necessarily want to do exactly the same. But I think we can play our part and we can make a contribution by working together with others. And the first step for that in this situation in the Middle East it would be for Winston Peters to go to the Middle East. He hasn't done so. He hasn't announced any plans. I hope that's coming up. But I think if he did do that, and go and if he went and talked to his counterparts throughout the Gulf states, you know, throughout other parts of the Middle East, if he went to, um, you know, every country he could, um, like the Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong has been doing, she's been at least going there. Uh, other plenty of other countries, they've spent a lot of time in the Middle East lately. They would hear, I think, Mr. Peters would hear about New Zealand's good name and good reputation, and it has particularly been a product of. And Jacinda Ardern and her response to the Christchurch mosque attacks in 2019, uh, New Zealand's early response to COVID-19, and this has really made an impact. And the number of people when I was in the Gulf, a number of officials, journalists, academics, others, who would bring this up proactively, I wouldn't mention it wow. necessarily, but they would bring it up that they really admired New Zealand's response uh, after the mosque attacks, the compassion, uh, the message of tolerance that was sent. And that really gave us a a real boost in the Middle East. And you know, remember, this was an attack on Muslims on two mosques. So it was it was watched quite closely uh, in the Middle East. Jacinda Ardern had her image projected on the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, the world's tallest building. You know, it, was, it had a big impact. And I think uh, it goes also beyond that. I mean, the way New Zealand has acted in the past over the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the fact that uh, you know, New Zealand was willing to co-sponsor a, a resolution in 2016 under John Key that condemned uh, Israeli settlements uh, and when New Zealand was on the UN Security Council. You know, all of these actions collectively over decades have built up and given us a good reputation in that region. So, you know, we could be putting all that to good use right now, um, but it's not something that the, the current government is particularly interested in, it seems. I, I think still think there's time. I don't think the window of opportunity is closed completely. Look, it is only six service personnel and we've got time. We could potentially still do both, but you know, over time, if you keep gradually nudging your way uh, towards Australia and the United States, eventually you'll become a, a US ally again. And perhaps that is actually ultimately the plan that will just gradually become a US ally over time, not with a big bang, uh, but just gradually with many, many steps, it all adds up to something. What is it saying? How do you eat an elephant one mouthful at a time? Um, this is my last question. Oh, boiling, uh, well, frog and boiling water, whatever yeah. you um, and Chewy, I, I'm throwing this question to you as well because I am definitely the dumbest person in the room for this conversation. Because Chewy, you know far more, more than me about the New Zealand Defence Force and stuff. But if what what we're saying, what you're saying, Jeffrey, is there's a win for America, you can't really see a win for New Zealand in this idea. Then using Occam's razor, which is you know the fewest number of assumptions to get to a conclusion, or often we say the most logical conclusion is more often than not the night the right one. If there's no win in it for us now. What does Occam's razor tell us about this? Why then has the decision been made? Why has Luxon and his and his parties said, yes, let's send six people if there's no win it for New Zealand, as you see it, Jeffrey? And Chewie, I definitely want you to jump on that as well. 
Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey? please. Yeah. Please, you go. Well, in terms of what's in it for for New Zealand, I guess it just depends on the way you see the world. I think some of my colleagues, they see the world as a very dangerous place at the moment. It's becoming more dangerous. And therefore, New Zealand needs the protection of much bigger states and, uh, you know, needs the protection, the umbrella of an alliance. Uh, and I think that's probably what it comes down to most, that they're looking at what's happening. They see China as a threat. Okay. And uh, they think that New Zealand needs to stand with its traditional allies and partners, if you like, uh, and and therefore become closer with Australia and the United States. I think it probably it boils down to that essentially. So, so Occam is right. So we get protection. We get the protection oh, of the okay. state when it's a dangerous world. I think that's probably so. The, Occam's right. You know, Occam's razor for the government says big scary world we need to be with big brothers in case anything goes wrong for the government yeah what, and, what you... and look, look look also being an independent being independent and driving the independent foreign policy forward is hard it's hard work um because you're on your own i mean that's what independence means um it's 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 harder it's it's easier to do kind of what canberra and washington have sort of set out for you they provide the template you just sign on to the joint statement you know, someone's already done the work for you. It's actually easier in a way when you're in an alliance in an alliance or an, an alliance like relationship or an alliance light relationship, you might say, you know, decisions are sort of, you know, decided in a way for you and you need to just evaluate and sign your name. Um, so, you know, there's a simplicity to it. Uh, I, I think it's it's far more valuable for New Zealand to, to keep this independence. And one person I spoke to when I was over in the Gulf made the point that actually we're all more valuable to these bigger countries like Australia and the US if we keep a level of independence because right. we've got more to offer then than just being another name on the list. Uh, we're bigger than perhaps our 5 million population might suggest and i think new zealand is a bigger actor in foreign policy terms than our population might suggest and, and bigger than other five million uh, you know population countries if you go to europe you'll find plenty of countries of five million people and perhaps they don't have the they don't have necessarily the significance that new zealand has had uh, and that's because we've taken more of an independent stance all right joey do you want to have any thoughts about that before we wrap up yeah look i i, I think when you look when you look at New Zealand's position in this sort of geopolitical uh, state of the world, I, I think it's 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 very true that I think people are almost crystal ball gazing and going, "Well, what happens if China decides to flush all all of its trade and and, and all of the money that it, that its party members are making to charge across the strait and take Taiwan?" Maybe they're going to take a bite out of the South China Sea. At that point, we're going to need the the US Navy to come and bail us out because for some reason they'll make a beeline to us or something like that. <laughs> um, I think those people have read too many Tom Clancy books, personally. Um, I, I love the idea of building more of a, a relationship with the smaller players, the smaller countries like Singapore, like Malaysia, like our Pacific neighbors and that sort of thing and and that be our voting block we're a nation of trade but having a relationship with singapore as our defense forces have done for many many years is is incredibly important all, all the trade in this part of the world goes through singapore mm. to to go off and yeah as I said, just be a name on a list. And when I when I first saw that list, uh, when the White House said all of these countries are supporting us and and bombing the the Houthis, I, I looked at that and go, ah, that's because we're in Five Eyes. It's it's almost an automatic inclusion at that point. Um, but yeah, sending sending forces there, like. Yeah, but in the end, look, we need to... the, the other point I'd like to make just before before we finish, I assume our time's almost up, is that we need political solutions here. And whether it's Gaza, whether or the Palestinian territories, whether it's Yemen itself, which has been in a civil war since 2015, it's a, a, in a dire state, actually. In many parts of the Middle East are in a terrible way at the moment. You know, you've had you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in Yemen. There's 5 million people subject to uh, famine conditions. 
uh, you know, it is terrible, but we need that. That's why we need a long-term um, settlement there. And there were peace talks underway last year. There was a truce underway. Very, very uh, uncertain now, given what's what's been happening in the last few months, whether that will continue. Uh, but then, you know, the wider the what's happening in Gaza, we need that ceasefire immediately. And then we need talks for a two-state solution. I mean, it just seems obvious. You're not going to solve anything with a military solution, whether it's in Gaza with Israel invading Gaza or whether it's US airstrikes on Yemen. These are just short-term military solutions. Airstrikes never solve anything. Mm -hmm. it might, in, the, in the short term, it might work. You know, you might destroy the Houthi missile launchers and missiles so they can't see missiles, but there'll be more on the way that come. And you will also just create a whole lot more resentment. And what do you think the population will, will do in, in Yemen? Will they, you know, will they become more pro-US or will they become galvanized behind the Houthis and more pro-Iran uh, as a result? You know, you're not going to win any friends through these kind of airstrikes. Uh, you know, they're short-sighted. It's, it's an easy yeah. solution to the airstrikes. You're not risking any of your own soldiers' lives necessarily because you're just doing it from the air. You're not putting boots on the ground and you think, you know, we're going to just destroy this this military infrastructure. But it will grow back like a plant or grow back uh, even stronger. Um, and, you know, unless you get those long term solutions, you know, you will be in an even worse position uh, in the future. So that's what New Zealand needs to do. In my view, we need to work on the political solutions. The good thing is it's actually quite cheap because it involves diplomacy, dialogue, you know, you don't need big militaries for that work. You need diplomats, you need time, you need an interest, you need your foreign minister traveling, talking. Um, you know, it's something that small states can do really, really well because it doesn't require a big uh, military capability. It just requires you know, a level of, of smartness, really, and uh, now that you have uh, through your foreign ministry, through your foreign ministers, and it's the, you know, the power of, of uh, dialogue and the power of, of speaking really that gets you there. Cool. Hey, Jeffrey, um, really appreciate you uh, jumping on board and uh, chatting with us uh, tonight. If people want to find out more about you, want to read your works, uh, jeffreymiller.info, jeffreymiller.info. And at the about page, there's all the social medias, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok. What's X-I-N-G? Zing, it's a German uh, social media network. So uh, for business, it's kind of like the German LinkedIn. Um, all right. That's that's why I'm on there because I, I did spend a number of years living in Germany when uh, back when I was a translator. So and I um, and I approve that you're still using the word Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, all there as well. You need to say share. I need to update my website, don't I? Yeah. But yes. um, but if you scroll down there, Pat, you get all the uh, links and uh, various interviews, YouTube uh, interviews. You've got the one the TVNZ package that went out last night, uh, and you know you get all the columns that I I I write. Um, and you know various interviews where I'm quoted, so it's all there uh, if you're interested in reading my work. So jeffreymiller.info/about, just a little plug there. So thank you very much.